let's get started. Thanks everyone for joining today. Um, the name of our session is putting the G in, in PLG. Um, I'm joined today by Adam Schoenfeld, as in show and tell, as we were just learning, um, and Camille Trent from Pure Signal and Key Play. So thank you both for joining. Thanks for having us. It's good to be yeah, here. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so quick intro and uh, hopefully, you know, I don't butcher it here for you, but, uh, you know, known Adam for a bit. Um, Adam spent a lot of time in the, the PLG space um, before founding Keyplay and Peer Signal. Uh, he sold a business to uh, Drift, where I was actually an investor and a, an advisor. So thank you for all your hard work there, Adam, um, and led strategy there for them. And then started Keyplay and Peer Signal, where Common Room's happy to be a customer of them to really help people understand uh, the dynamics of their customers and their ICP. And so, Adam, maybe just a quick intro from, from you. Yeah, no, I've, I've been a longtime entrepreneur and I got really interested in the PLG movement about two years ago. Um, met Camille a little bit after that and brought her in to help run Pure Signal, which is like the media arm of our business where we, we publish a lot of research on what we think of as modern go to market. And so, PLG, community, the new way of ABM. Um, we kind of focus on the themes that we think are really interesting and, and emerging. And so, I've been doing that and then building P uh, Keyplay, which is a SaaS product, as you as you mentioned, that helps yeah. people figure out their ICP and, and do that account selection. And Camille, maybe just a quick intro from you. I didn't mean to focus so much on Adam there. <laughs> no, he, he pretty much covered it. I uh, I liked the vision um, of Peer Signal at the time and uh, and then launching Keyplay as part of that. And so joined at the end of uh, last year and uh, just been building both since then. Awesome. Well, it's it's great to have you both. Um, you know, specifically as we as I can see here in the chat, the the topic here is putting the G in PLG or growth. Um, as I said, we've you know been working together, talking together for a while, but most notably recently, you published a study with what about over seventeen thousand. Is that correct? Um, PLG mm -hmm. companies, venture back companies that you've been working with, and around kind of what makes them great? What is that G uh, to their PLG? And so we're going to start today by kind of going through that and reviewing some of your, your findings. But um, before I share some slides to guide us, anything you want to say about the study to kick us off and give context? Sure. We've, we've approached this from a number of angles. We started just by building an index of PLG companies. Um, we've had that going for about two years. And so we have a, about 750 companies on that that we've just been tracking. And those are all, you know, we discover them through our, our web crawlers, but then hand curate that. And then we also did this like broader study, which you mentioned, where we looked at a bunch of venture back companies recently. Yeah. And then we dug into 40 that um, we worked with OpenView to create this rising 40. So these are kind of the up and comers, right? Like everybody hears about Notion and Airtable yeah. and Webflow, but like these were the less funded up and comers. So some interesting things that we kind of pulled from across those different um, areas of research. Yeah, and I love it. And also I'll, I'll bring up the slides, but I think, you know, one thing I'll highlight here as we go into it, um, you know, PLG, there's now, there's there's plenty of buzzwords out there, right? I think, you know, or buzz acronyms as it, as it may be. So your ability to really help folks understand, well, like, what is PLG and what does that actually mean? You know, do they have sales reps, which we'll go through, right? Is it actually, it's just like, they have this amazing product and people swipe credit cards. No, they have sales reps, right? And to back to what you said earlier, this idea of what is a modern go-to-market, I think is a really interesting topic more broadly that PLG kind of sits tangential to. Um, so we can spend some time on that as as, as well. Okay. Um, let me pull up the slides here. Always scary for me. I spend a lot of time in Zoom, so anytime I have to share something not in Zoom, I'm like, oh god. How's I know I'm the same way. If I get invited <laughs> to a call on Google Meet, I'm just like I'm frozen for about yeah. two minutes until I figure out how to set my background. Yeah. Quick embarrassing story because um, everyone likes those. There's there some chat about that. I when I first started at Common Room, I got the opportunity to present to executives from Microsoft. 
and I had just gotten my common room laptop and it was my first time using Teams. So I logged into Teams, Microsoft Teams, to present to Microsoft executives around how common room could help them. And the security settings meant that before I could share my screen, I had to restart Teams. So I had to tell all these Microsoft executives that run the O365 programs or product line that I had to restart Teams so I could present to them because I'd never used it before. So that was great. So we're off to a great start, everyone. So putting the G in PLG. I thank right. you for sharing that. I like it when an experienced CRO like yourself will share those moments because you know like every AE, that's, every SDR that's ever got on any call has had yeah. something like this. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so that's Gust. Um, you look at these, you know, kind of 40 rising stars. You can see some of the logos here. Um, let's kick over into what makes a good market tick or, um, and we'll go through each of these separately for folks, um, but maybe just a quick overview around some of your findings to orient us. Sure. Camille, add in where I miss, please, because Camille did a lot of this work. Um, we This came from our friends at OpenView. Um, they're not an investor in us, but we just love what they do in the space. So highly recommend Kyle Boyer and Blake Bartlett if you're not already following them and you're interested in this stuff. I think they actually coined the term, or maybe there's some debate on the internet about who coined it, but I think they coined the term PLG and they've uh, produced a lot of great content. So they basically ran the selection process for the Rising 40 and had like a bunch of people from the community submit who are the up and comers. And then they had an expert panel that picked them and we enriched all that data using Keyplay and helped with the, the research and analysis. Um, these were the four things that stood out. You know, number one is, is a theme we've seen many times at every way that we cut it. I know that Atlassian had very few salespeople up to whatever billions <laughs> of, of enterprise value, but it's not that common. It's more common that you do have some hybrid of the product doing the selling and people doing the selling, and especially as companies go out market. Um, so that, that shows in the data. So PLG does not mean you fire your sales team or you need zero salespeople. Um, Second thing which we see a lot is the use of community. And we just looked at this at the surface level, which is, do they have any kind of forum, Slack group, or Discord, right? Does the company have like a, a an owned and operated um, community? And we see it really common amongst PLG companies, like 3x more than your standard oh. SaaS company. And this rising 40, it was even more. So I think the up-and-comers are looking at Notion, right? And they're looking at Webflow, and they're like, wow, can we start now when we're early? and build community and then have that kind of fit into the, the PLG motion. I think we could talk about how that flywheel works and some of the, the tactics. Yeah. I think that's where it gets really fun. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, the, it's like trial or free. You just see all these flavors of it. So I don't think, I think like people get constrained and like, I need a free trial or I need a free premium, but amongst successful growing companies, we see all these different flavors and combinations. Um, and then finally, it's just, these companies are still like, investing and growing, which I think is a good sign for this, this group of companies. Obviously, the the venture climate today is a lot different than 18 months ago, but we're yep. kind of tracking like, are they hiring? Are they hiring marketers? Are they like, yeah. are they looking to grow, grow? And we do see that. That's great. Cool. Um, well, thanks for the overview. Um, let's jump into some of the actual data. Um, so here's, you know, obviously the rising 40, a nice graph showing this data. Um, I mean, I, th I think what's fascinating is you see, you know, I don't know who that far right <laughs> uh, dot is, but that's a high percentage of, you know, sales headcount in any company, let alone a PLG. But notably, you know, we're in that kind of 15% range. Um, and so let's just maybe dive into a bit around like what's underlying that? What did you see? Any additional insights? Yeah. So we, we basically look at the percent of headcount that, ha that is in the sales function and uh, looking at that uh, uh, by total employees as well, because it gives you context to where they are in their maturity and their evolution. And this is the, those rising 40. Um, and yeah, it's, it's interesting because Generally, like as they get bigger, they invest more in sales. You, I mean, you can kind of see that loosely. When we look more broadly at our PLG index, we do see that, right? Like sales kind of comes online more at around 100 employees uh, in these companies. But even the smaller ones, like if you look at around that 50 line, you know, you're still seeing 
10, 15%. So they're, you know, they're bringing in a few reps even really early on. And I think yep. that reflects that it's a, it's either, okay, we're going to have product led on the low end. And then once we qualify an enterprise opportunity, we're going to use sales or they're using sales to convert, you know, product qualified leads into opportunities and deals. Yeah, that makes all sense. Um, what I think one of the interesting questions here is, or like points is that um, folks often don't know when to bring on a sales team or like when to scale it up. I know these mm -hmm. are all earlier companies or the rising 40, but anything there um, that you saw that is worth kind of touching on? When we do zoom out, we we do uh, and look at a, a larger number of PLG companies. We see it more around like a hundred employees, where they start to seem to be scaling sales. So I think you could you could look at a lot of these companies like they're in that you know experimentation phase mm -hmm. when they're smaller, where they're like, okay, we're getting some signups, some usage, maybe some self serve conversion. Like they yeah. have the product led aspect going. And they're like, okay, how do we either increase ACV or conversion rate? And that's where they bring in, you know, maybe one group of reps to start doing a sales assist motion. So I think I think that's kind of what, what the data says now. But, you know, there's no one size fits all. Like yeah. some of these people appear to just build a sales team as if they had a traditional inbound demo request motion. Like they're they're staffing up just in that way where like as their AR grows, they're like adding sales capacity. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I think I'll, you, you see, you know, people will sign up, they'll swipe a credit card, but to really get that deep adoption, right? And to grow, you do need folks to help evangelize, to help walk them through a process, to help op operationalize it, right? I think we've all are, you know, or at least I'll speak for myself, but I think it's everyone. We've all know that you sign up for a tool, it's interesting, but actually finding those use cases, getting it deployed across various teams can take some handholding and can take someone helping you really understand what that value is. And so I think one element there is like, confu let's not confuse the initial uh, awareness, right? And the initial kind of hook you can put in to a potential buyer with what it takes to actually get them into a full deployment that is your quote conversion event, right? Right, that's right. Yeah, and the whole kind of single player to multiplayer comes in yeah. here too. Yeah, right. Where it's like if you have a single player mode where an individual inside of a company can sign up and swipe their card, that's great. But a lot of times, what they want to do is parlay that into a CIO, CMO, you know, company yep. level purchase, which a lot of times is just nearly impossible for that to happen on its own. Yeah, I mean, I think the famous, I don't know, maybe it's not famous. The story I always think of is as Slack was growing. Right, there was an element of you know everyone signing up and what their what the Slack team was doing was just saying, hey, there's you know I spent ten years at Okta and this is what happened at Okta. Hey, there's ten different teams at Okta that are using you, CIO. Do you want to wrap and roll this? Right. Yeah. Um, so interesting roles like that. So maybe that's a good segue um, into community. Because, oh, there's more slides here. Um, sorry, I was thinking about going right to community, but um, let me find the community. The, the, that one's interesting if you want to go up okay. one. Yep. Yeah, this, the, uh, up to the three boxes. I think down one from there, sorry. Um, yep, gotcha. Uh, ne next one. So, sorry, yeah. So the I think this just kind of highlights what you were saying, Jake, right? Which yeah. is, you you do have people all over this map. So we gave a few examples if you're, if you're like me and you like to just go click around on these companies, I would say here's three examples of different configurations at roughly the same headcount. So Tynes yeah. has built a pretty big sales team. Red Panda is sort of your typical size, I'd say. And then Buffer, which perhaps uh, related to the fact they're bootstrapped or we could we could speculate there, has a really small sales team. Yeah, interesting. Um, cool. So... Um, Super much. Anything you want to add here? Otherwise, I'll. No, I, th I think we kind of hit yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So um, we kind of talked about, or I <clears throat> mentioned the idea of a lot of PLG is that acquisition funnel. Um, and, you know, obviously, Common Room helps people 
grow and leverage their community. So we're biased to this topic, just to be honest. Um, but uh, we saw, you saw that, you know, PLG rising folks were really investing heavily in community and this element of how do you think about awareness? How do you think about that modern customer journey is, is really in, interesting, right? And so maybe just spend a minute here on what you saw, some of the initial findings. Yeah. So first of all, these PLG companies, just on the surface, do they have a community? We, we don't know how successful it is, but just do they have it? They're way more likely than the comparable, you know, SaaS companies. If you just look at the general population. So we compared this yeah. to, I think, let's, let me look at my fine print, about 14,000 SaaS companies in that same headcount band, 20 yeah. to 500. And it's just way more. And this, this shows up consistently when we look at our bigger PLG index, which has all the like high flying logos. And we compare that to their peers as well. Same story, right? Maybe the, the multiple is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's it's because it, it's such a powerful flywheel if you get it working, right? Yep. Where it, it doesn't just impact acquisition, but it, it can help at every every part of the journey. So, it, you know, if you have a thriving community where people are, let's say, creating templates, like let's mm -hmm. let's take Notion as the yeah. you know, sort of the ultimate, right? So now not only is their community driving awareness, but they have actual they've empowered users to create templates. Those users are monetizing those templates within the community, right? Yeah. And, and that's just driving so much stickiness because it's actually making the, the product experience better for the next user because they can go access all this value that the community is bringing. So I think it's so compelling in PLG because you just see the, the combination of self-serve, broad distribution, big audiences combined with like, a healthy community can can yield so much like value in in many different dimensions from acquisition to retention to advocacy um so i think it, it can be like this incredible flywheel yeah no absolutely you're you know obviously pushing to acquire one thing i wanted to um i guess highlight here is that this analysis really focuses on you know i think what you've called owned communities and you mentioned it a bit at the at the top of the conversation but just for everyone, a quick definition of, yeah, what is an owned community in, in this case? We're really just looking that they operate something. Like they have okay. a forum, Slack group, a Discord, Discord. Yeah. something like that. Um, I, kn I know that there's like gray areas and lines and like sometimes a newsletter can kind of feel like a community if it's interactive. So, but we were, we're looking those for those specific yeah. types of things. Okay. Yeah, super interesting. I think, you know, one thing just for our listeners context that common spends a lot of time on is, you know, most of our customers, you've mentioned a bunch of them, Notion, you know, as, as one that's come up a couple of times, have that own community. But when we think about community, we also think about the community flywheel as the broader, you know, conversations happening across, you know, Twitter or LinkedIn, or if you're a technical product, then, you know, GitHub or Stack Overflow, those places. I think that's another really interesting part about this quote community flywheel where, you know, I'll give an example. Um, Figma, another great PLG story is one of our large customers. You know, they Twitter became a support channel for them where the community of their users, the community, quite frankly, of, you know, the de designers using mm -hmm. a product like theirs, were talking about it on Twitter, giving each other advice, they were chiming in, you know, the folks at Figma chiming in to give, you know, even deeper advice or context or answer a question. And so um, I think it's something to keep in mind, it starts to blur the lines of call it like social listening or some of those social programs. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the things I joke about is, you know, you have a community, you're just not listening. And so, yes, you should create an owned community. But there's also a community of folks that care about the problem you're solving that are out there talking about it in a subreddit, as an example, right? Totally. I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think we get stuck on like a community is this like structure, like it, it's a Slack yeah. group or it's a thing. But it's like, I think if you think community with a capital C, it's like this, it's like the people you want to serve or it, the community already kind of exists. And then it's like, what are the mechanisms you're going to use as a company to get involved in that. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, we're specifically looking at the own communities here, but I think it does, you know, they're on LinkedIn, they're on Twitter, they're, they're using third party yeah. properties too, in interesting ways. Well, it's that, it's that modern um, 
go to market that you that we've talked about a couple of times here, right? Uh, I spoke previously with the founder of Lavender, which is an SDR tool, um, mm -hmm. very PLG driven. And, you know, he's like, hey, like basically our entire marketing is on LinkedIn, right? And I've built a community of folks that work in the sales profession. And literally when I post on LinkedIn, I can see our, our signups go up, right? Because people are chiming in, they're commenting on it. And LinkedIn's essentially a giant community of your peers, right? So some interesting angles there also to think about when you look at, you know, PLG and that modern buyer's journey. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, uh, but so yeah, real, real fast, yeah. the one other thing yeah. I'll say here is, yeah, while, while this chart reflects that specifically, like that owned community play, yeah, we also track other content and community plays. And so if you go through and just look at, you know, these top 40 um, or even on a broader sense, like, all of the those PLG companies, it's really common for them to also, as Adam said, have that template play as well. Um, so what I would call like community adjacent marketing plays, right? Um, or go to market plays. And so community, I also see events and webinars pop up a lot. And so it's really the mindset, right? It's yeah. like this mindset of community. Um, yep. And then we have some research later on talking to how they also tend to be pretty good at audience building with, which is, I think, a good leading indicator of whether yeah. or not you can do community. Absolutely. Um, okay. With that. Um, so here we go. Here's some of our research leading up into it. Um, I'll kind of skip through, I know we've talked about a bunch of stuff, but uh, Neil and, you know, please let me know if there's anything you want to touch on here specifically. Um, I think that branded community um, and hiring for a community is actually pretty interesting, right? So um, even in the height of tech layoffs, when a lot of companies weren't hiring, and this kind of speaks to the power of community and how it feeds into this PLG motion or the, the flywheel, as we've talked about it, um, even when folks were in the midst of layoffs, they were still hiring for a community um, because they understood the importance of that, and this is even PLG, this is Cloud 100s, they understood the importance of that to building their brand and making their users successful. Yeah, I was pretty surprised by that because I think in a lot of company, a lot of B2B companies, those are the rules that are really hard to justify. Mm -hmm. But in some, in a lot of, but on the flip side, in a PLG company or in a company that has the mindset Camille was talking about, it's like they prioritize this. They keep yeah. that, like, well, all times are tough. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, we've kind of talked about this. Even the smallest have community in the flywheel, um, and it's a no-brainer. I think, yeah, particularly developer and uh, insecurity de developers. You know, and certainly from our experience here at Common Room, um, if you're building a, a developer-led company, uh, community and DevRel is pretty much, you know, I would say one of the first things you should invest in to make sure that you're meeting those developers where they are and building that trust relationship with them. Yeah. I feel like it's kind of a must have now if you're, if you're yep. a dev tool, but yep. it, it's not like it's there's, I think it's still more of a white space, even in, in areas where you think like even in marketing mm -hmm. tech and sales tech, it's like not as common. And so I think a lot of the, the principles that these developer tool companies use yeah. can still apply if you're, you know, if you're not in that space. Yeah, I think it's in, I think that gets into this idea of like owned versus not owned, where like, you know, developer tooling, you know, there are areas that are, you know, where developers go. GitHub, as an example, right? You're going to be on GitHub, you're going to be starring repos, you're going to be having conversations um, and doing all that. And I think there's more of a, again, what we're saying is there's more of like a, a known motion there um, and how that feeds into that PLG flywheel. But going back to what we talked about with these kind of non-developer tools, um, you know, whatever, sales and marketing tech stack, like sales and marketers are on LinkedIn all the time, right? And that's where they're going to learn from their peers what they're using and why it works. And yeah, maybe you can conflate that with the idea of like, you know, social media or marketing or whatnot. Um, but the reality is, is you're thinking about your community and how do you reach people where they are and get into, you know, those niches. Because if I care about what, you know, Camille thinks and she comments or likes on something, I'm getting access to her community or her peer group, right? Absolutely. 
Yeah. And I think on the, on the bootstrap side of things too, uh, you know, like a decade ago, it was HubSpot saying like inbound marketing and it was primarily uh, yeah. SEO, right. That you could do if you're, if you're bootstrapped, you couldn't do paid ads. It was too expensive. And I think this is just kind of like another way to do inbound. Um, mm -hmm. If you think about it that way, um, it's yeah. become kind of more, the more modern way to do it is just betting on community uh, type plays, like uh, betting yeah. on community in general to go to market. Um, absolutely. Okay. Um, some examples here in terms of Slack communities, you know, Slack and Discord, I think are probably the two most common that, that we see. Um, and then over time, people might, you know, graduate up into a more like purpose-built forum. Um, but spinning up a Slack community or, uh, or Discord is a really easy thing to do. And what we see is it becomes something that, you know, and you talked about this a bit, Adam, but it can touch so many parts of the customer life cycle. So we have customers where it's a huge sub support channel. And so there's a bunch mm -hmm. of efficiency when it comes to that kind of post-sales process. But in doing that, you know, it's also a place where your prospects will go. And now you need less SEs as an example, because that technical support can be driven by the community and folks chiming in and say, oh, try this, do this, right? Um, and so, you know, just as an example, one of the things that we track with Common Room, um, you know, kind of out of the box metrics are, you know, okay, when someone's asking a question in your community, one, are they getting a response? But two, are they getting a response from someone that works for you or from a community member? And what we see is that as you, you know, as adoption increases and, you know, that flywheel really starts to take place when your users, your members of your community start responding to one another. And that becomes, you know, that only just accelerates that flywheel and the, and the power of things. All right, um, I'll skip through this. So I think this is kind of on a related note here and the, maybe a bridge into this idea of owned versus unowned. Um, but you know, now we're getting directly into social media, right? So give us a quick overview. <laughs> you might need to squint at this chart. It's a little bit, yeah. this is this is one of my classic charts. Camille, didn't, Camille, you didn't really give me a hard time for this chart for some reason, because this is, <laughs> but the uh, uh, we, what we looked at, it, we just looked at LinkedIn. So I think, you know, it's a partial analysis. We didn't have Twitter. We didn't have GitHub. We didn't have some of the other things. But if we took our big index of SaaS companies and compared it to our PLG index, as well as this rising 40 group, um, first of all, just on an absolute basis, the PLG companies had more followers mm -hmm. on an average. Um, <clears throat> but then if you look kind of size adjusted, like per employee, um, they had a lot more. So that these rising 40, like, this cohort has like a fairly sizable audience, you know, building effort on LinkedIn um, relative to how small the companies are. So you mentioned yeah. Lavender, like they're a great example of that yeah. or like a hockey stack. If you know those guys, like mm -hmm. really small company, I'd like to put key play in this category too. We're a, <laughs> we're a very small team, but we're bu building like a significant audience early because yeah. we think that's important to get started on you know, and yeah. not like wake up when we're hundred employees and say, Oh, what, maybe we should, maybe we should start building an audience. Well, I think it also gets to, you know, I joke about this all the time, but you know, I don't know how many of us on this call, you know, wake up every morning and you've got, you know, X cold emails in your inbox, right? Like that's a, that's a tough way to break through the noise. Um, but back to this broader, community of peers, if you're following things that you care about, people are commenting on it, that's a more trusted resource. And I think maybe what this gets into, I think it's actually a really interesting topic, this idea of like trust and how do you build trust? And a lot of that, you know, more than ever now is at some level built by, you know, people that you care about, that you follow on these digital platforms. What are they commenting on? What do, what do, what do they care about? Right. And so some interesting kind of almost like psychology there, I guess, as you think through it. Totally. I mean, it helps outbound too. I remember this at Drift because Drift, when, in the, when I was there, built a really great brand and audience on social media, on many channels. And then when people, when the reps were doing outbound, the common response was like, hey, we've heard of you, you know, which is much yeah. better than if you're just like random, you know, yeah. AI startup, yeah. you know, with no audience. It makes yeah. so, I think it, it like, kind of greases the skids on a lot of other things you do if you can get this going. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's the, uh, I guess, you know, kind of touching on, you know, multi-touch att attribution at, at, at some level, which is a whole other topic uh, for another, you know, conversation. But you're not going to get through just one angle. So how do you build awareness? How do you get people to understand what, you know, who you are, what you're doing so that when the time is right, you can actually, you know, land mm -hmm. it in whatever you know, medium you're sending that, right? Cool. Um, let's scroll through here. Um, I guess we're on to the next, uh, which is this idea of like, what is PLG, free trial, freemium? Um, I think this is an area around, there's a lot of confusion, I guess, right? Around what is the actual PLG motion? Um, and is it that you can just swipe a credit card? Is it, you know, freemium, free trial? So... Yeah, we, dig we, we define we think about it in our research as you know, some aspect of self serve, like sign up, try, yep. buy. We don't we're, we're not too religious about you know the whole thing has to be self serve. We just kind of think like do they have some aspect? Um, and what we see is just you know, like hybrids, different models. I think we're going to see different emerging models too, where it's maybe doesn't look like a free trial or freemium. Maybe it's kind of got some different flavors maybe it's sort of like a more like a media asset that you log into and that's hmm. the free version it has some connection to the product i think the lines are just gonna blur between your content your community your product like all these things kind of will be tied together in some way and i think the best companies are just gonna let buyers do more learn more try more in some way um yeah. So we look at this, we, we look at like, we've looked at reverse trials a lot too, which is basically a combination of free trial and freemium. Um, Elena Verna has really good stuff on this. So I highly recommend um, reading her can you stuff. Do, can you define a reverse trial for folks? Just, I think that's maybe something that isn't as prevalent these days. Yeah. So the, the reverse trial is basically um, you sign up. So it's, you have a free tier. Yeah. Um, but then when you sign up on the free tier, so you have a free forever plan, but then when you mm -hmm. sign up on the free tier, you get put into premium on a trial. Got it. Right. So you, instead of just being a trial that then you have to up that ends and you upgrade when your trial ends, you, you revert back to the free tier, which Got is it. a really nice way to like give people the full power of what you do and try to convert them on that. But then having a fallback where if they don't get engaged there, you can, they're still a free user. Got um, so we, we see that quite a bit out there uh, as like a rising trend as well. Yeah, that makes total sense. That's actually, that's actually what Common Group does. I I guess I started off this with an embarrassing story. I'll add on here. I did not know that what we did was called a reverse trial. So I've, I've also learned something today. <laughs> I think it's very baseball. I don't even know if it's, it's we have to Google, we'll have to check Google Trends if it's even a popular term. Yeah, got it. We're helping um, right here. Any recommendations, any findings in terms of, um, you know, kind of like what, what model of this works best for certain companies, right? Um, you know, there's obviously a distribution, um, but yeah, anything, any findings around what might be best for our listeners and how to think about where they should go depending on their product? I think it's so situational. Um, somebody in the chat was talking about complexity of product. So I think that's yep. one one way you have to look at it is how complex is your product? Do you have a true like single player, multiplayer dynamic? Mm -hmm. It seems to me that if you have single player, multiplayer, then freemium is is probably pretty natural because the free plan is can be single player and then the paid plans can be the multiplayer. If you don't, that's where I think it's a little bit more of a, of a choice like do is it a free trial or is it a free is it freemium but it's usage based is it freemium you know is there usage and time elements so i think this one i i really think that you have to go from first principles about like who's your buyer what's the complexity of your product yep. and what's the sort of the way that it gets used and bought got it yeah Great. another another thing i'll chime in um on here too is i think the free trial like as you're seeing in this chart is the most popular because one, it's like the easiest, it's the easier one yeah. to implement, right? Um, it's easier to implement. There's the urgency behind it of like you have the 14 days. And so you can justify it um, on a like unit economics basis, right? Whereas like if you are a really expensive like product to run, you might not be able to justify having like a, a 
a premium product um, if it's gonna if it's gonna cost you, right? It's gonna cost you more than it's gonna make you. Um, and if you if you can't ride that out, so figuring out kind of like what that equation looks like mm -hmm. for you, if it's gonna be a profitable thing for you, I think that matters here too. Um, and I go into that. Uh, we go into that a little bit in the the link that I dropped the article on outlining the five different types of free. Um, and then we give a lot of examples of which type of free for, for different types of companies. Um, yeah. And so that might be worth a look for people that are trying to figure out where they're, where they fit in um, and kind of like where to get started. Um, and then the, the last thing though, that kind of came to mind is between this and what we were talking about before about um, it not being an either or for sales led or product led. Yeah. And this thing, it's not an either or for, premium or free trial or any other type of free offer that seems to be like a recurring theme with modern PLG companies, right? Is that they're not, they're not thinking like one or the other, they're thinking about the full buyer journey and how they can cater to that full buyer journey, right? Like at right. what point are we going to need sales? At what point do they need like a concierge experience? At what point do we want to drive that urgency in the freemium plan so that uh you know so that they're on the, the free trial or so they're experiencing more of the product so that they yep. can eventually buy the product so um it's really like this holistic thinking that seems to be like the common theme between like the winners and uh, the losers <laughs> but yeah. between this so um that's that's what really, really stood out like between those two is like they yeah. don't think either or even for community they're not thinking I just need a community. They're probably thinking, okay, I need to build an audience of some sort, build that yep. trust. And, uh, and then at some point, like I'll, I'll have a community because people will be likely to join the community because they got value from the content um, or because they've been following us. So they're yep. really thinking holistically most of the time. Yeah. Love it. Um, well, I want to make sure that we can give time for some Q and a, um, I really appreciate obviously, uh, both of you walking us through all this great content. Um, you know, I'm sure I think you dropped the the link meal, but uh, you know, there's a bunch more here that I would highly encourage folks to look into and you know read through the research and understand some of the options that we talked about. Um, but anything either of you want to say to kind of close out this section while we then go to some Q and A? No, I'm, ex I'm excited to do some Q and A. The chat's been lively, so curious what Perfect. people want to answer. All right, well then let's do it. All right, um, questions. Now I'm, I I will admit that when I when you share with this, I can't see the 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 Q and A, so I may have missed some of the. There's one popping questions. up there. Do you see? Yep. Uh, do you see? How does PLG relate to RevOps from AP? Love it. Um, Josh, hopefully I got the name right. Yeah, um, I think it's a great question. So actually, I'll just quickly, I spent 10 years before Common Room helping to build Okta. And one of the things that I ran at Okta was was RevOps. Um, and I also ran enterprise sales teams and other things, but I had RevOps. So um, I'll, I can take the, the, the first part of this. But um, I think really, you know, PLG, the way I think about it is a lot like, it's much more data driven at a high level. And I think that's what RevOps <laughs> really tries to focus on, right? Um, you know, when you're running a more, whether it's a more traditional top sound enterprise sale, which is, you know, what Okta was to be clear, um, you know, you're much more into, I don't know, medic or, bank, you know, some of those kinds of ideas, right? Around how do you qualify as a, as a sales rep? How do you think about, this account going to move forward. Whereas with PLG, the biggest thing is you get such rich data, right? So how is this, you know, prospect using our product? Are they hitting certain, you know, um, aspects of the product that we know are, are value added? If you have a community, are they engaging in our community? What are they saying? What questions are they asking? And so that level of context and the ability to, you know, whether it be product usage or whether it be what they're saying in community, if you can bring that all together, which wink, wink, common room does, quick plug, um, and serve that up, that's something that like RevOps is like, you know, on the front line of doing and making sure that you can, um, yeah, be, be efficient with your team. 
Do you think sure. the roles are a lot different? Like the skills and like the day to day of RevOps is a lot different, or the priorities in PLG companies versus like your traditional enterprise led? Because I think you're so right. They they have more data. It's almost like a DTC company or an e commerce. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe totally. not that level, but it's if you were to put on a spectrum like Chewy e commerce to yep. maybe Okta or, or maybe Aptio, like somebody that sells a million yeah. dollar SKU, like yep. that you know, the data volume is, is a lot more. Does that change the the skills or the projects that are? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. Abs I would say absolutely, right? I think, you know, you're whatever. In the well, in the Aptio example, I think a RevOps role is a lot more around like sales process and, mm -hmm. you know, forecasting and, you know, like uh, trying to, I don't know, put some science to the art that is enterprise mm -hmm. sales, if that makes sense. Whereas, you know, if the other end of our spectrum is Chewy, shout out to my dog and cat. Um, we get Chewy boxes all the time. Um, you know, that's something where RevOps can really play the role as having to um, just really drive like focus and efficiency. You're like, you're almost like, I don't know, maybe the example is like, you're almost like, like an SDR at some level. I don't know if that's a weird way to say it, but in enterprise sales, you have like SDR function are trying to qualify things so that your sales team can be efficient. At a PLG company, RevOps can take on a lot more of that because it's more data driven. Mm -hmm. And right? so, yeah, like all the systems are more automated, right? Yeah. So it's, there's like this whole. And your, and your yeah. funnel is automated based on context and data versus, you know, quote, more art based on people, you know, having conversations on the phone or email, right? Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's a, it's a great question, a AP. Um, all right, another question came in. Does the sales headcount vary by AC? There we go. And Bill, does the sales headcount vary by ACV or sales cycle? Um, you so know what? We should look at this. Is something we should try to look at, Camille. I think this is this is pretty good. This is a great question. The answer is probably it does, right? Like the ones that have an enterprise plan or have a higher ACV, I would suspect that kind of goes hand in hand with more sales headcount. It would be really interesting to find the outliers to this. Like I'd love to find the highly complex product that sells a high ACV that has a lower than typical sales headcount um, and, and learn from them. But I, I suspect this is pro that it probably does. Like if you have that higher ACV, like the unit economics makes sense to be able to put people on it. And that goes hand in hand probably with more complexity, more of a considered purchase, more buying groups, buying committees need to sign yep. off. So that would be my 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 uh, suspicion, but we, we haven't looked at that in the data directly. Okay, great. Oh, I, I it was, Bill, we're on the same wavelength because I was just talking about the complexity of the product. So um, I, I, told, I think that those, those go hand in hand. Um, Complexity of the product as well as complexity of the buying process. How many people are uh, involved? How high up do you have to go to get approval? I think that's going to drive a lot of the decision of like when and how and how much sales touch to apply in a most in a product led motion. Yeah, this, all, this also kind of connects back to the community and why we see community uh, in developer tools and highly like complex tools, right? As it kind of provides like the self-serve uh, way to interact with and uh, support the product um, and those types of tools. Other questions from folks? Going once, going twice. <laughs> um, all right, Bill dropping some knowledge. You go check out Kyle Polar on it. Um, all right, well, appreciate uh, everyone joining us today, and mostly Adam and Camille. Thank you for your time. Um, super insightful conversation. I'll reiterate for folks, um, there's a lot of great research. We just kind of touched on it today with the slides we were showing. So, you know, please go check out Key Play. Um, get their assets, join their community. Um, and then certainly if you want help with, uh, you know, thinking about some of this data that we talked about with product usage and community act activity, um, we'd love to talk to you at a common room as well, but mostly uh, appreciate you joining our community in this conversation.
Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being an awesome moderator, Jake. This was really fun. I hope no we get problem. to talk about this more. Happy to do it. Thanks, everyone.